Last time, Joker and Scarecrow teamed up with a plan to kidnap the mayor and send the police and fire on a wild goose chase, and Firefly was on the loose, burning down Gotham, on top of all the other crap going on with the Arkham Escapees. This time, we are covering Detective Comics 662 and Batman 496, which will take care of the Scarecrow, Joker, and Firefly plot arcs. The Detective Comics issue is written by Chuck Dix Dixon, with pencils by Graham Nolan, inks by Scott Hanna, lettering by John Costanza, and is co-edited by Jordan B. Gofink Corfinkel, with the Batman issue being written by Doug Mensch, with pencils by Jim Aparo, inks by Joseph Robenstein, and lettering by Richard Starkings and co-edited by Scott Peterson. And both issues combined have colors by Adrian Roy and are co-edited by the legendary Denny O'Neill. We open on de with Detective Comics 662, with Riddler's gang not being happy. They want to pull off the score, Riddler or no Riddler, and they're not going to wait for confirmation that his riddle was received, so they drive him off gunfire. Riddler walks through the streets, fuming, fuming. How will his genius get the attention it deserves? And then he walks in front of a TV display and has an epiphany. In the Batcave as well, Robin is also fuming. He did the legwork for tracking down Firefly, but does not get to take, down, take part in the bust. Instead, this is strictly Batman handling this. As we see that Firefly is down to his last target, the Gotham Zoom. However, back at the Batcave, Robin is channel surfing and sees another interview with Dr. Flanders, right as the Riddler emerges from the crowd with explosives seemingly trapped, trapped to him. At this, Robin and Alfred head to the studio. At the zoo, Batman takes on Firefly. Now, I don't talk a lot about the fights. There isn't as much to recap with these. It's, I ain't the kind of blow-by-blow -blow fight recap person here. I, everything I, I love everything about this image of Batman and the Flames here. It's a great visual combined with some really solid voiceover narration. There's better voiceover narration or um, narration to come, I will say, but this is really solid. At the studio, Riddler is having something of a ball. The dialogue very heavily implies there is a history between Nigma and Flanders at Arkham. It feels like the words that Nigma is throwing back in Flanders' face are so or a quote of something the Flanders would have said to him at Arkham. It's not explicitly stated that he has a grudge, but again, it's strongly implied. And Dr. Flanders, we've met before, haven't we? Y uh, yes, Eddie. And I see you've written a little book. I'm sane, and so are you. Well, you couldn't have written it with me in mind. Excuse me? Because I'm not sane... And I never will be. Isn't that right, Doc? Montoya and Bullock are on site, and GCPD has a sniper with a shot on Riddler. But Riddler's got a detonator with a dead man switch, so they can't act. Elsewhere, Riddler's crew pulls off their score with flying colors and without him. And they converse here about... Riddler generally coming up with really solid plans, and their basic only reason they cut ties with them is because they were sick of waiting. Back at the zoo, Batman and Firefly fall into the big cat enclosure, allowing Firefly to briefly slip away, but again, not for very long, because Batman finally manages to get him with a bat line and leaves him dangling over the crocodile enclosure. At the studio, Robin swoops in and epoxies uh, the hand with the detonator on Riddler, allowing the police to move in. Bullock berates Robin for his recklessness, but Robin manages to vanish while his back is turned, as the bomb squad reports that the bomb was a fake. And wrapping up Dr. Flanders' plot arc, he is completely deflated at being confronted by one of his former patients. As the Riddler's former goons leave with their loot, they are ambushed by another vigilante, the Huntress, who they don't recognize, because this is probably her big, real re-debut post-crisis on Infinite Earths. Huntress's costume is fine, but I think it would be better if they added some form of knee pads with the costume, um, just on a general principle. Also, and dump the V-neck, both in terms of the, the vulnerability of, of having, you know, the part of your chest where your heart is just exposed without any sort of body armor or protection or Kevlar or anything like that there. Otherwise, I kind of dig the costume. Um, 
Uh, the additional leg protection probably would be good just because you're running across rooftops and that sort of thing. Same reason for the knee pads. But also I understand that it's an athletic activity and people sweat and people sweat in different places. So I don't know. Um, also, I'm a sucker for swashbuckler boots. Like no matter what hero wears them, N not male, female, Marvel, I do I've always dug like the the Silver Age, Bronze Age Hawkeye with the swashbuckler boots costume. I wish they found a way to put Cap in swashbuckler boots in Captain America: The First Avenger. I, I I dig that part of any superhero costume, and we need more characters with swashbuckler boots. Back at the Gotham Zoo, Batman is exhausted, and there are still so many villains left. We wrap up this episode with Batman 496. Batman is dead on his feet. Scarecrow and the Joker know it. Though at their hideout, tensions are running high and whether they want to keep running the GCPD ragged or if they want to move on the Bat. Ultimately, they decide to move on Batman, using some tunnels that the Joker had picked out for an earlier plan to lure him into. Meanwhile, at the mayor's mansion, Bullock, sent, Bullock and the police have arrived, and Bullock is through waiting for the bomb squad, decides to charge in, in spite of the whole incident earlier at the amusement park, only to set off a booby trap. He only escapes certain death through a timely intervention by Batman. Considering the tone of this story, I find this panel here with Batman castigating um, Bullock over this kind of hilarious. Joker and Scarecrow, with Kroll, drive to the Gotham Tunnel and blow both sides using a rocket launcher and head to the access tunnels. I'm assuming the rocket launcher they're using here was among the hardware dumped by Bane and company at Arkham. Bane and crew watch the carnage on the news. Bane is impressed by Joker and Scarecrow, but he is confident Batman will take them down. But then, once he's done so, they will make their move. Batman moves in and faces the Scarecrow first, who hits him with the fear gas. Oh, sugar. You just gone and done the dumbest thing in your whole life. This backfires spectacularly, because whereas the last time we saw Batman get fear gassed, he flashed back to the death of his parents, here the Joker is present, which means Batman has got Jason Todd on the mind. On and so Batman very quickly takes down Scarecrow before proceeding to the Joker and beating the shit out of him. <laughs> Snakes, crow, serpents, vipers, venom and fangs, sss, rattlers. What? Just a boy, good at heart, more brave than a man, too brave to become a man. Jason. Jason. Just a boy. His parents fell in blood. His own ru life ripped and torn from the world he protected. Jason! Just a boy. Never to breathe or speak or move again. Jason! In retrospect, mistakes were made. Now, the only thing the saving Batman from crossing the same line with the Joker that he almost did with Zaz is Scarecrow launching a missile into the roof, causing the tunnel to flood, and forcing Batman to choose between saving Kroll or finishing off the Joker. And he chooses to save Kroll as the tunnel continues to flood. This was a nice conclusion to this mini-arc with Scarecrow and Joker. Actually, the mini is pretty much the key word here, because it's almost about the same length issue rise as the storyline with, you know, um, Firefly. In fact, arguably, they get, I mean, while well, they get more screen time than most of the other major rogues gallery characters we've encountered so far, like uh, Poison Ivy, it's still, like, it's still a B-plot, a B and that's probably the complaint I have with this little storyline, is... By having this team up be part of Nightfall, having it be a B-plot, and to my knowledge with these two characters never having teamed up previously, it means that the characters are having less time together than they would if this was the center of a major, say, a major like, six-issue arc. Because you could do, you could get six issues of plot 
out of Scarecrow and Joker team up to do a job together, to do uh, a big heist or that sort of thing. And that's kind of the main point here. Like, this isn't a strike against Nightfall necessarily, but it is something of a strike a against what this means in terms of like why the way this storyline fits into the event. It's a storyline that merits its own central focus story and as well, rather than just being back up for Bane's larger plot. Like I don't have any problems with Nightfall as the main plot. It works. It works really well. I like Nightfall. But this is to a certain degree wasted potential. It feels I, I think the way I describe this would be to use a pro wrestling analogy, this would be like putting your main like your like really big main event match people have been waiting for for a great deal of time as a mid card match. Not like a curtain this isn't like Brett versus Owen as a curtain jerk as the curtain jerker at WrestleMania. This isn't like that because that really gets the that that was a deliberate choice to really hype up the crowd and get the audience really ready for what the main event was going to be. Um, and they had a bunch of time between that match and the actual main event to let the audience cool down a bit, but also with them still being excited and hyped up for what's to come. This is like right in the middle of the card or even in the middle of the card, like little before the actual main event, like putting something that blows the audience away and just has them like just knocks their socks off right before what is actually supposed to be the main event. But not necessarily or could have done that, but doesn't necessarily give it the full thing. Um, and normally you would do something like that you continue with the wrestling analogy for something where a, a matchup where you're feeling people out a little bit, where it's like, hey, is this is this Rob Van Dam guy and this un uh, gonna work o work well with um with Jeff Hardy? Are these two guys gonna match up together well? And the ultimate answer is yes, yes they do. And so you, it it, it sets up okay, these guys have good in ring chemistry. These work two work well together. They will work together again in the future and in, in at later events when they're the focus of a bigger program. The, can you know the, the somewhat tormented metaphor? Um, this is less of that because this is a case of Scarecrow and Joker are like two of the biggest guns in in the Batman rogues gallery. Two of the biggest names, and they have themes with they have character traits which are complementary but not totally contradictory. We do see them clash. We see a clash of personalities here, but there is the definite sense of these two characters can work together well and will work. And if teaming up, can be a really dangerous threat. It's that sort of thing. But then, but still, that said, next time we have the moment that we have all been waiting for. So. The question becomes is how well does Bane versus Batman follow up this? And we'll find that out next month. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 